Well, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, many of you have been asking me about uh, my granddaughter, Livia, and how she was doing. Uh, we had dinner with Livia and her husband just Sunday night, and uh, she's already starting to see uh, good things that God is pulling out of this experience. But for you to get an idea how she's doing, we took this photograph of her. As you can see, she's doing fine. And she's just working through the emotions in a wonderful way and sees how God's going to use that to give her a compassion for other women and other people who've gone through trauma. So God's been so, so, so good. Well, we want to continue our study on the hard sayings of Jesus. And these are two of the hardest and misunderstood because Jesus appears to, to make a promise that he doesn't keep. He appears to make a statement that he's in error, made a mistake, twice. But if Jesus, we have a Jesus who makes mistakes and is in error and doesn't keep his promise, then we don't have a Jesus. Uh, we don't have one who is the visible image of invisible God, Colossians 1.15. Fullness of deity, dwelling in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. And so we need to take a look at these two occasions. And this really being the Holy Week, this is a good week for us to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So pray with me as we open up the scriptures. Heavenly Father, again, thank you. We are so grateful we can gather. Lord, I pray for those who, who can't be here but maybe are listening, Lord, through the direct view. I pray for them. I pray you would strengthen their bodies, encourage them. And then, Lord, for those of us here, thank you that we can enjoy each other's presence. We are gifts to each other of encouragement and prayer and support. And yet now, Lord, we gather and we want to understand. What did Jesus mean that there was a generation right there with him that would not taste death until they saw him coming in his glory? Lord, we want to understand. So we pray you'd give us that understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. God's people said, Amen. well, there are two occasions where Jesus makes reference to a group of people uh, who would not pass away in their lifetime without seeing the future coming of Jesus Christ in his glory. Now, Jesus even describes his uh, second coming, in case you're wondering, a little surprised by that, under oath. After Jesus was arrested in Matthew chapter 26, they were trying to, Caiaphas, the high priest, they're trying to get him to blaspheme. They were trying to catch him, saying that he said he was going to destroy the temple in three days, he was going to raise it up again. And they bring in false witnesses. And Jesus sees that the whole thing is a bunch of baloney. And in verse 63 of Matthew 26, Jesus says, but Jesus kept silent. He's going to respond to that kind of stuff. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now he's under oath. So what is Jesus going to say? He's now confronted. Is he the Messiah, the Son of God, or is he not? And if you ever expect Jesus, maybe people misunderstood him. If there was ever a chance for him to clarify the situation, that he's just a prophet. He's just a good teacher. He's just a wonderful man and a model and an example to inspire. But listen to his denial. <laughs> Jesus said to him, you've said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's quite a denial. How did the priest respond? Tore his robes, said he's blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? And so the, coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ is very clear. Uh, but was he saying to these folks on these two occasions, standing there with him, that they would still be alive when he returned in his glory at this coming in the clouds? The first occasion is a remark he makes in Mark chapter 13. When he's speaking to these people and he says, this generation will not pass away until these things happen. And that these things seem to be his second coming. It's Mark chapter 13, verse 30. We'll look at it in a moment. The second occasion was in Matthew chapter 16. Here he gets real specific, and he says some of those standing there with him would actually see the glory of his coming. Well, one thing we all know is 
All these folks are dead. They tasted death. They did not stick around alive, and Jesus hasn't returned yet. So what, what's the story here? So let's take the first occasion in Mark 13. You know, it's always helpful. We said in real estate, three most important words are what? Location, location, location. So it is a Bible study. Context, context, context. So let me read to you here in Mark chapter 13. And this is the disputed uh, section. Mark 13, starting with verse 28. Here you, you read Jesus saying, Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. For truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, some say, well, this generation, that word generation can't be translated race. That this, the race of the Jews are going to be not extinct, even though every country in, uh, has tried in, in some attempts to attack and eradicate throughout history. And yet, Zechariah chapter 9, chapter 12, chapter 14, we'll take you there in just a little bit. Uh, when Jesus Christ returns, the generation, there will be a generation still alive of Jews. And that's what Paul meant, and then at that time, all Israel will be saved. Not every Jewish person. But those who are part of Israel at the time of the return of Christ, you're going to see why they're going to be saved, just like Paul said in Romans 9. But right here, it appears that Jesus says that when you see these things happening, then uh, there's some of you, this generation, because most likely the word generation means generation, those people living at that time. Well, like I said, you know, uh, the context of what he's talking about when he says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. What things take place? We assume his second coming. But that's impossible because of two reasons. One, he hasn't come yet and these guys are dead. And two, look at the next verse. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, Jesus right here, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but Jesus says, I don't even know when I'm going to return. You'll see in a moment why he doesn't know. But he says, I don't even know when I'll return. Now, if Jesus doesn't know when he's going to return, how can he promise that you're going to be there when he returns? Well, he doesn't even know when he's going to return. So he knows these, these things that you shall see apparently has nothing to do with his second coming, but rather has something to do with something else that did happen. Well, how can we determine what's he talking about? Why don't we go to the beginning of the discussion in chapter 13 and look at the first two verses. And as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, Behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. So he's talking about the remarkable buildings, remarkable stones of the beautiful Temple Mount. You, you, you've got the temple there, which is 100 feet high, made of white marble with gold gilded roof. It was quite a sight. And this, this particular, he says, for 40 years they've been working on this thing. And his disciples just saying, isn't that remarkable? It is the centerpiece of the worship of our people. Well, Jesus doesn't say anything until he crosses the Kidron Valley, goes up to the Mount of Olives, sits down. Now he's going to start talking about what this disciple said. Verse 2, when Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. So, and as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were questioning him, him privately. So now he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, that's about 200 feet higher than the Temple Mount, looking across the Kidron Valley to the Temple Mount, that beautiful temple and the beautiful buildings that they were so impressed with. And he just said, hey, one stone will not be left upon a stone. That whole thing will be destroyed. And they can't believe it. So they've got some questions. 
Notice it says Peter, James, and John, and Andrew were questioning him privately. Now, what do you think they're questioning him about? What he just said. And what did he just say? He wasn't talking about his second coming. He was talking about what? When these beautiful buildings will be so destroyed, there'll not be one stone upon left another. They can't believe it. And they want some clarification. So they say in verse 4, tell us, when will these things be? What things? When the temple's destroyed and not one stone is left upon a stone. And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Jesus, when the temple is destroyed, what's going to be happening? Verse 5, and Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. But be on your guard. For they're going to deliver you to courts. And you will be flogged in the synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings. For my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first start going out. Preach to all nations. And when they arrest you and deliver you. Do not be anxious beforehand. What you're going to say. But say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak. But it is the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother to death. And his father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all on account of my name. But one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, right away you read this and we assume what? Well, this sounds like it's what he describes in Matthew 24 previous to his second coming. So we assume he must be talking about second coming. But again, their questions were about not the second coming, about, but about what? When the temple's destroyed and not one stone left upon a stone. When that happens, there's going to be an onslaught of slaughter of Jews and a frightening time for Jews. Now he says in verse 14, there's a phrase. Uh, this is called generic fulfillment. Generic fulfillment in the scriptures is when you have a prophecy that's fulfilled two, three, four times. And they were very aware of this abomination. He says, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, now let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, now they knew about this phrase. Because this phrase has been made famous. It's out of Daniel chapter 9. And initially, the first fulfillment was by a Greek king named Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus, basically his name, uh, Epiphanes, means great wonder, great view. Jews called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means wooden head. So there really was not much of a relationship. And the Jews basically war and revolted against the Greeks at this time. And Antiochus, we're told, that comes in and does an abomination desolation because he goes into the temple, Jerusalem, and not only does he take it over, but he sacrifices a pig on the altar to God. An abomination of desolation. And that's what began the war with Maccabean period and Maccabees, that whole thing. So in one sense, Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9 had already been fulfilled once. There's already been one abomination of desolation. Jesus is going to say, and there's going to be another one. But there's going to be a third one that's going to be when I actually, just before I return. Because you hold a temple that's so sacred, it's going to be torn down. An abomination and desecrated three times. So here he goes on. He says, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. Now he says, understand. You know what I'm talking about. He's still answering their question, which is about what? The temple being destroyed, not one stone left upon a stone. It says verse 15, and let him who is on the housetop, don't go down. Or enter in to get anything out of your house. And let him who's in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it be not winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the creation. Which God created until now and never shall. And unless the Lord had shortened those days. No life would be saved. But the sake for the elect 
whom he chose, he shortens the days. And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is Christ, behold, there he is. Don't believe him. For false Christ, false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead even the elect astray. But take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. Now like he's answered their question. But since they're talking about the abomination that they're going to actually see in their lifetime, he says, but let me tell you more. 24. But in those days after the tribulation, in a later date, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory and then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Now learn back to present. So he says, Yes, and there's going to be another abomination when I return. But for right now, let's get back to learn from the parable. So in other words, what's going on? What if these things that he says they're going to see in their lifetime has nothing to do with the second coming, but rather a different event? What's interesting is like I said, he already said in that next verse, verse 32 uh, that he does not know when the day is coming, that he will return. By the way, why, why is that? Do you ever wonder why it's taken so long? I mean, Paul talked like he expected Jesus to return in his day. Peter talked like he was hoping Jesus would return in his day. But it's been 2,000 years. Jesus, are you coming at all? As Peter says, what the critics say in 2 Peter, <laughs> he says, hey, he hasn't come, it's been a long time. You know, he's not coming. And you know, in your weak moments, sometimes you can even wonder that. Of course, if he came in June of 1966, I would be in deep soup. But I didn't come to Christ until that August. Matter of fact, if you go back, we won't take time, but if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, some of you might remember our study in Revelation. If you go back to Daniel chapter 7, there's Daniel's view, picture. He has this vision of the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, sitting on the throne. And the context is he's bringing judgment. And when everybody's so fearful, remember, one like the Son of Man approaches him. That's why Jesus always loved that, uh, that title to himself, one like the Son of Man. Because one like the Son of Man approaches him and it says the Ancient of Days gives one like the Son of Man a gift. A gift of a kingdom, dominion, forever and ever. So the Ancient of Days is going to give this one like the Son of Man, his son, this gift of a kingdom. Now if then, that's when the Son will return once he's received the gift of the kingdom. Now, if God had given this gift to Jesus, the Son, in that first century, so that Paul and Peter could have seen it, well, that would be a pretty small kingdom, and it's pretty much Jewish, wouldn't you say? But the prophecy is that this gift, this kingdom, according to Isaiah, would not only have Jews, but have Gentiles and tribes from every tribe, every tongue, from every nation. There will be representatives in this gift. And if you were a father, and you were going to give a gift of a kingdom to your son, would you fill it with people who don't even care or love your son or even hate him? No. So you want to know why it's been 2,000 years? It's because the father is populating the gift. That's why missionary work is so important. Uh, remember the 144,000 in Revelation 7? And it's like they're protected so that they cannot be killed by the Antichrist. And remember, they're like 144,000 Apostle Pauls. And they're sent out to the rest of the world. And I call them the missionary cleanup crew. Because they finish the job so that everybody has at least an opportunity from every tongue, every nation, to be part of the gift, the kingdom, that the Father is going to give to the Son. That's why the Son does not know when he's returning. Because it's going to be a gift from the Father. And only the Father. Matter of fact, remember John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45? Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father who's given the gift 
draws them for, as the prophets say, they shall learn of me from the Father, because the Father's populating the gift. Who do you think gave you the, uh, the, the ability to recognize the truth about Jesus Christ, who he was and what he did? Do you think that was an IQ test? Do you think you figured it out on your own? I know some really smart people are Christians, and I know some really dumb people are Christians. So apparently it's not IQ. It has to do with the Father knowing the heart is populating this gift of the kingdom. He will give to the Son. And in some kind of mysterious thing within the Trinity, apparently he's not revealed to the Son when that's going to be. That's why it's been 2,000 years. But here, the, these things Jesus is talking about here, he's answering their questions about the destruction of the temple. The, these things he's talking about was the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, a prophecy that was fulfilled in their lifetime. It was only 40 years after he spoke these words. You see, in A.D. 69, some 40 years later, the Jews revolted against Rome. Not a good idea. At that time, Titus Flavius Vespasianus took three legions of soldiers and came down and quelled the rebellion. The following year, since he was going to be emperor, he sends his son Titus to finish the job. Titus comes in AD 70 and destroys Jerusalem and the temple. And the city is burned. Limestone burns. Turns back into sand, basically. And in AD 70, some one million Jews were slaughtered. Now, does it make sense what he was saying? If you're on the housetop, man... Run, Jews, run, run, run. Because a million Jews would be slaughtered at the AD 70 by Titus. Now, it's interesting. Jesus said in the first two verses, well, at least he heard, as they were saying how remarkable the temple and the buildings were, that not he'll be so destroyed, not one stone left upon a stone. Interesting. Today, you can go to the Temple Mount and you will not find one stone left upon a stone. Don't confuse that with the Western Wall. The Western Wall was never part of the temple itself. The Western Wall was part of the wall that surrounded the court of the temple. The back side of the temple. That wall. But the temple itself, not one stone is left upon a stone. How does this happen? Archaeologist Dr. Arthur Custance later found that it's true. Literally, not one stone was left upon a stone. And the reason is because of all the gold and the silver that was in the temple. When it was set to flame, all of that melted down into the cracks of the foundation of the temple. And guess what everybody did for the next 25 years? In pursuit of the gold and melted silver, they pried up every stone left upon a stone. So here Jesus stands with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, directly opposite of the Temple Mount across the Kidron Valley. He's about rising about 200 feet on the Mount of Olives, looking at the city. And like I said, the building was very impressive. The temple was 100 feet high, pure white marble with golden gilded roof line. It was quite a sight to see. And these disciples could not believe it would ever be destroyed. But Jews were acquainted. There was already an abomination, desolation, and there's going to be another one. And again, this generic fulfillment, multiple fulfillments of the same prophecy. So here in Mark 13, Jesus sees the fate of Jerusalem. Now, he already had seen that because remember in Luke 19... Jesus is praying, and he enters the city, and he cries. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, And when he approached, he saw the city, and he wept over it. I always kind of wonder, why is he weeping over the city of Jerusalem? Read on. Saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in from every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. 
And because the leadership of Jerusalem rejected the king of peace who would come. Therefore, Jesus wept over Jerusalem because he knew of its what? That it would be destroyed. How badly destroyed? Not one stone left upon a stone. So Jesus is warning those standing there with him that slaughter was going to be in their history. The destruction of these beautiful buildings. And that's why he says no matter how admiring they are, how much you admire them, in fact, they will be destroyed and it will be within 40 years of these people as he's talking to them right there. And the prophecy is absolutely fulfilled. Some were still alive to see that slaughter and destruction. Now, the second occasion where Jesus is accused of being in error, it's found in Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew 16, Jesus is um, talking to his uh, disciples there. And, and he says this in, in uh, verses 27 to 28. Matthew 16. He says, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that seems pretty right there. Jesus says, I'm going to be coming again in glory. And some of you are standing right there. You will actually see me coming into my glory. But what do we know? These guys are dead. They did taste death. And did they ever see Jesus coming in his glory? Well, first thought, you go, yeah, sounds like Jesus makes a mistake. He's an error. But again, a one rule in Bible study is when you read a verse and you're confused, what do you do? Run to Pastor Daryl. No. No. You read the next verse. Now remember chapters. It's chapter 16, the last two verses. Chapter 17, chapters were not added to the Bible till about 600 A.D. to help us be able to find things in the scriptures. Before that, it just kept on growing in the scroll. So let's keep reading because chapter 17 begins with and. What do you think and means? We call it a conjunction because it conjuncts. <laughs> in other words, he's still talking about the same thing. And what's he talking about? There's some standing here right now who will see me coming in my glory. So read on. After six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was what? Transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. And his garments became as white as light. And Moses and Elijah shows up with him. And he's having a dialogue. And the three disciples, they've wet their tunics. They don't know what to do. Peter, he comes out. So we make three tents so they can hang around and have a little vacation on the earth? And yet what's interesting is what do they see? What do you mean Jesus was transfigured? Well, he tells you right there. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His garments became as white as light. When's the next time we see Jesus that looks like that? If you go to Revelation, remember in Revelation chapter 1, here's John, he's on the exile on the island of Patmos, a penal island. And he's out there waiting to die. He's out on the beach and all of a sudden he hears this piercing sound like a trumpet. And he turns around and what does he see? He sees Jesus. But, oh, man, it's been about uh, 55, 60 years. But he doesn't see the same Jesus he saw. And it says in verse 14, And his head, Jesus, his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like the burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters." Whoa, this is Jesus and his glorified. Now, John had seen him six years before that in his resurrected body. Remember Luke 24? They're all, boys are hanging out, scared to death because they just executed their leader. Guess who's next to be crucified? Us guys, lock the picking door. And they don't hear a, 
and they don't see Jesus walk through a wall. He just like from one dimension to another, he appears to them. They think he's, he's a ghost. But there's no mention of him in his hair and face like the sun. That's not until the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, when he does return, huh, look, look, look at what it says in chapter 19 at his actual return. This is Jesus returning in his glory. And what does he look like? Verse 11, Revelation 20. I'm sorry, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, the white horse. And he who sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are like the flame of fire. Upon his head are many diadems. He has a name written upon him which no one else except himself knows. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. So what did the disciples see when Jesus transfigured himself? They saw Jesus coming in his glory. They saw him exactly what he would look like when he comes the second time. And so again, Jesus is not an heir. They would see the glory of the coming of the Lord when he was transfigured before them. Now, there's one more thing, by the way, in this conversation is that there is going to be a generation of Jews who will be alive when Christ returns. As a matter of fact, uh, in Romans 11, verse 25 and 26, remember Paul says there's going to come a time where all Jews will be saved. Not every Jew has ever lived, but those Jews in that generation when Jesus Christ returns. You say, how, 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 how do you know that? Well, let's go back to Zechariah. Let me show you three passages. Zechariah is the second to the last book of the Bible. So the last book of the Old Testament, I should say, Hebrew canon. Remember, it's uh, Malachi. Those of you Italian, you keep saying it's Malachi, but it's not. It's Malachi. But uh, 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 it's what you have is Zechariah. Look at the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. This is now God speaking to his people, Israel. Chapter 9, verse 16. And the Lord, their God, will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they are as the stones of a crown sparkling in his hand. Well, how, how so? Look at chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn when the jews of that generation when christ returns and they see his return they'll realize that the rabbis has been lying to them i had a good friend who was a rabbi we we agreed that we agreed on everything with the scriptures except for one thing has the Messiah already come and is coming again? Or is he just coming? That's the only thing we disagreed on. And we disagreed a lot on that. But here it says that when Jesus does return, the generation of Jews living at that time, notice the grace and mercy poured upon them because they'll recognize whom they had pierced. And so you look at chapter 14 of Zechariah verse 9. And the Lord will be king over the earth in that day. And the Lord will be the only one in his name, the only one. And then he says this. Where is it? Verse 3 and 4. Oh, keep reading. Chapter 14. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day, his return, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move towards the north, the other half toward the south. And you will flee by the valley of my mountains and goes on that he will bring judgment at that time. When Jesus Christ returns, he's going to return. Basically, his feet's going to land on the Mount of Olives and split that thing right in the middle. And there will be a generation of Jews living in Jerusalem. 
And they, when they see him return, they'll at that point, then they will believe the gospel. So what about Jews now? Hebrews 9.27, the point of man wants to die and after that comes judgment. It's neither Jew nor Gentile in this age of grace. Everybody has their relationship with God, no matter what background they have. But the prophecy when Paul said all Israel will be saved, he's talking about that generation when Christ returns and God's grace is upon them when they see the one whom they've pierced. Now, this is one of the greatest proof of God's faithfulness in his word about the Jews. I mean, as you study history, nation after nation has tried to eradicate the Jews. Why would the Hamas recently attack Israel? They're this little strip of land. Answer, they really believed that if they could ignite this, then Syria and Egypt and all the anti-Israel countries would all join in thinking, this is our chance to drive Israel into the ocean and eradicate these people for finally, finally the last time. And of course, as you've been reading history, if people have always, nation upon nations, always try to eradicate the Jews. But what's interesting is, when's the last time you had breakfast with a Hittite? Or how about lunch? Had a little lunch, a little Taco Bell with a uh, Moabite? Or have you had a real nice dinner? Nice, nice steak dinner with a Babylonian? All these different nations who've tried to eradicate the Jews from the earth, from history, they're all gone. And yet, when's the last time you had lunch with one of your Jewish friends? They're still here. Because God said, the Jew will be here until the coming of Christ. Now, here, here's a question for you. Jesus is not an error, as he foretold the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, before some of them would die, and that happened. As he foretold his own transfiguration of glory of his coming, and that happened. But the question is, is Jesus actually ever going to really return? Is the Father, the Ancient of Days, ever going to give him the gift of the kingdom? And after receiving that kingdom, Jesus brings, and he brings that kingdom to this earth, and then for a new heaven and new earth. Did you know that the second coming of Jesus is mentioned over 300 times in the New Testament alone? One out of every 25 verses in the New Testament makes reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The most remarkable thing is that every New Testament, every New Testament writer speaks of the second coming of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, remember in Acts, after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, as we're going to be celebrating this weekend, remember after he tells us, you shall be my witnesses. In verse 9 of chapter 1 of Acts, and after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and the cloud received him out of their sight. Oh yeah, I, I've read the critics. Jesus, if he left off that location 2,000 years ago, traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, he wouldn't be out of our universe. But does it say here he did a tour of Pluto? No. It says he, which is quite something, but he was received, a cloud received him, like he just moved from one dimension to another into a cloud. And it says, as these disciples, and if I was there, my tunic would be wet as well. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And I love their question. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Why well, you think Peter at least would say, Did you just see what happened? He just was here. He, who, cloud, poo, did you see it? But the angels do not give him a chance to blurt. Because they continue to say, This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. And what does Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 say? It says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribe of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, 
Oh, man. You know, John chapter 20. Here's your homework. Read verses 1 to 7. John chapter 20. Verses 1 to 7. We have an eyewitness. John was there. He writes what he had seen. And he tells us something very interesting. The morning of the resurrection, uh, a woman, Mary Magdalene, she goes early to the tomb. Why? Well, because he was crucified that, 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 that Friday, most likely. And, and, and it was around 3, 4 o'clock. They get him off the cross. But they got to get him in, uh, away in two hours because Sabbath starts at 6 o'clock. And you don't have Jewish bodies on crosses during the Sabbath. So they got to get him down and they got to get him mixed. And they've got to get him into the tomb before 6 o'clock which means they didn't have time to do a memorial service. And as of such a great man, whether you believe or not, he deserved the memorial service. So Mary Magdalene, early, now not during the Sabbath, Friday night and Saturday, but early that Sunday morning, she was there to make preparations for a memorial service or the preparation of his body or whatever it is. So she's up there early, but she sees the stones rolled away and, and the tomb is empty. And, 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 and she runs. Interesting, ladies. The most important evangelistic statement of the scriptures ever said was said to men by a woman. Take that one and put it in your pipe and smoke it, guys. But anyhow, Mary Madeline runs back. She tells Peter and, and John. Well, Peter and John, they've got to see this for themselves. So they run. John's younger. He wins the race. But he's a wimp. Because he goes, he looks in, but he won't go in. He's a little freaked. Peter, <laughs> right into the tomb. And what you have described in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 7, the most interesting detail. Don't ever miss the details. Because what John sees, he writes. And what he sees is the tomb is empty. Slabbed, the body's gone. The clothing, the, 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 the cloth on the body is thrown on the, on the floor. But the napkin that covered the face was folded carefully, rolled up, and placed on the slab. What's that? In Jewish tradition, when you had a meal, master of the meal would make sure that his doulos, his servant, would set the table just the way he wanted it. And then the servant would sit back and wait for the signal to clean everything up. What was the signal? When the master of the house was finished eating and was going to leave, he would take basically his napkin of cloth and he would crunch it up and throw it on the plate. And that was a sign he was leaving, he was finished. But if he took his napkin and folded it carefully and rolled it and put it next to his plate, the servant knew exactly what that meant. I'm not done. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And any Jew would understand exactly why that napkin was folded. Do we care about Jesus coming back? Well, let me give you this. 1 John chapter 3. You got John, the same eyewitness. Here's what he says. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. If you tell somebody you're a child of God, they're going to think you're nuts unless they're a brother and sister in Christ and they know God. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we shall be. Because at his coming, we shall be transformed, changed. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to have a body, according to what Paul said at the end of Philippians 2, a body conformed to the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus Christ. We shall be what we're going to be. We shall that. He says, we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him just as he is. Now, why is that such a big deal? Next verse. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Easter's coming, folks. This is Holy Week. I'm going to force myself to see that passion of Christ 
It's so violent, it's scary, but I sometimes forget what Jesus went through for me. And I'll tell you, Mel Gibson, he's wacko on some things, but he sure did a gift on that, that, that movie. But then on Sunday, we're going to celebrate the blessed hope that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. And why is he alive today? Because he's waiting to receive a gift from the Ancient of Days. And the moment he receives that gift, he's coming back. He's coming back. That's how the whole book of the Bible ends in Revelation 22. He says, even as though I come quickly, even come Lord Jesus. And what's our favorite word for that? Maranatha. Even come Lord Jesus. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter. And we'll see why would Jesus curse a fig tree just because it didn't have any food for him. Seems kind of a petty thing for the Son of God to do. We'll look at it next week. God bless you.